1 Samuel chapter 10, as we continue our journey through the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 10. The goal is to also get through chapter 11 as well, um, which we can do, Lord willing. As we've seen so far, uh, that the Lord has raised up a man named Samuel uh, to lead the nation back to the Lord. So he would be somewhat considered the last of the judges. And as Samuel is serving the Lord and ministering to the people, the children of Israel are demanding they want a king like all the other nations. And so they're tired of having all these other local judges. And so they wanted a king. So they're demanding a king. And this uh, devastated Samuel. And, uh, but the Lord had told Samuel, they're not rejecting him, they're rejecting the Lord. And so the Lord was to be their God. He was to be their king, but they wanted an earthly king. Uh, it, it wasn't time for that to take place, but the Lord is going to allow it to happen. It wasn't his perfect will for the children of Israel, but it was a permissive will. He allows it to happen. And again, it's a greater accomplishment what God's going to do through this situation. Just like in the politicians that we have today, you get what you vote for. But in the end, God places these people there to fulfill an agenda that he has in mind. So it was his permissive, permissive will. And as we see, it's going to play it out as their king's going to be a disaster with Saul. Not only that, but we see how the Lord tells Samuel that there's consequences of having a king. And, and so he tells him that in the last chapter, as we saw, uh, what the king's going to do. He's going to take their sons. He's going to draft them into his army. He's going to take their sons and make them work in his fields. He's going to take the daughters. They're going to serve him uh, some of the land for himself. He's going to put taxes upon it, servants for himself, and a list of other things. So he's going to, it's like, why would you want this? But yet we want a king. And so in other words, he's going to take from you, but that didn't change their minds uh, of the children of Israel. And, and then last time we saw how God sets up this an appointment for Samuel uh, and this man uh, to be the first king, Saul. And as chapter 9 concluded, uh, Samuel tells Saul to send his servant on ahead so he can have this private moment and chat with uh, Samuel, that he's going to be king of Israel. I don't think Saul was really wanting this, but it happened okay so with that as our background let's start in first down chapter 10 verse 1 then samuel took the flask of oil poured it on his head and kissed him and says is it not because the lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance now i can't imagine what uh, saul was thinking here as samuel's pouring this oil over his head anointing him to be king uh, and as strange as it sounds, it is also a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon Saul. Uh, the oil, as we mentioned in uh, last week's Sunday morning message, was symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And as you see with any ministry and any position, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit uh, working in our lives. We cannot do it on our own, we, uh, and neither can Saul. He needs the Spirit of God working in him. And uh, so this holy oil is being poured upon his head, flowing down. Uh, and, and because uh, apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, again, their lives uh, will not be fruitful. And the same with us. So again, there, it, it goes both ways. Every Christian, by the way, as we're in dealt with the Holy Spirit, uh, it's, it's for the empowerment for service. As Acts chapter 1 verse 8 tells us, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And uh, you'll be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit uh, in our lives to do the work he's called us to do and to be witnesses for him. And, and the more we allow the Spirit to uh, affect our lives, uh, the more we're changed. Uh, the more transformation takes place in us. The, and he ministers to us. He strengthens us. Now, Samuel's words, again, to Saul uh, are very important. And first of all, it was the Lord that anointed him. It had nothing to do with Saul himself. Uh, the Lord made him king, and, and now he's king over the Lord's inheritance. Verse 2 goes on to say, When you have departed from me today, you will find two men at Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zilhab. And they will say to you, The donkeys which you are looking for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worried about you, saying, What shall I do about my son? 
So why would Saul believe these words from Samuel? And again, uh, you know, uh, there's this crazy old guy. First time he met him, he's telling him these prophecies, right? Well, because Samuel is going to give him three signs, as we're going to read in this text, um, to show this is from the Lord. So this is confirmation number one. Uh, what uh, Samuel told Saul, he's going to find these two men by Rachel's tomb, and they're going to tell him that the donkeys are found, and his father's worried about him. You see, if Samuel was really a prophet of the Lord, then these things would will come to pass. Okay, so it has to come to pass if it's of the Lord, and um, and, and it's going to be confirmation for Saul uh, that the Lord has really anointed him king over Israel. Verse 3 goes on to say, And you shall say, You shall go on forward from there and uh, come to the tabernacle tree in Tabor. And three men are going to uh, go up to God at Bethel and meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. So this is confirmation number two. And again, as strange as it sounds, it's just confirmation that Samuel is a prophet of God. And again, you see how specific Samuel was getting here. It wasn't being vague uh, about, hey, you're just going to go to uh, this general area. No, he was very specific where it was to go, how many things were there. Uh, and, and what he says is going to come to pass. Verse 5 goes on to say, After you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there, the, the city, you'll meet a group of prophets coming down from on high in the place with stringed instruments, tabarine, flute, and a harp before them, and they'll be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned to another man. Let it be that these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. So the purpose of these predictions really is to validate the, to, to Saul that he is the king, right? So it's just confirmation. Everything that Saul uh, was to do and in, in hear from Samuel uh, is going to come to pass. And, and let's face it. Saul could have just thought, hey, this crazy old man pouring a bunch of oil on my head made me king. Yeah, it's going to happen. Yeah, right. Right. So you could have easily thought that. But by giving all these sort of specific, detailed predictions over Saul's life uh, over, say, the next few days, uh, it's going to help validate Samuel as a true prophet. And remember that Saul had no interest in being king. Uh, Samuel came just to... Um, uh, Saul came to Samuel just looking for donkeys, right, back in chapter 9. And so <clears throat> Samuel turns around and says, well, you're going to be the first king. Well, that's not why I'm here, you know, but this is what he's going to hear. So in order for Saul to accept this, Samuel gives him all sorts of specific predictions to validate Samuel's word as God's word. And so the third confirmation, as we see here, is uh, what Samuel said to him is true, that it's going to come uh, to these uh, group of prophets uh, with all these different kinds of instruments. And, and when it happens, God is going to change him into a new man, uh, or, or what was symbolic of being poured out of uh, the oil earlier, as now we're starting to become a reality as Saul is empowered to be king. And again, Please understand that Saul is not walking around with a giant cape on with a K on it, uh, for short for king, uh, on a shirt, but now he's empowered by God's Spirit. And, and so the Lord tells him that the, the um, prophet Samuel, let it be when these sides come to you, you shall do as an occasion demands, for God is with you. So in other words, Saul, you need to walk accordingly. It's one thing to hear it, but now you got to do it. So do those things that God was showing him, and, and, and again, so must we as well. And, and truly, uh, it's a walk of faith. Now, these three signs that Samuel gave to Saul was kind of an interesting picture that emerges when you start to think about it. First of all, you have the concern of the father. Uh, as, as Kish was concerned, Kish was Samuel's father. And now, uh, as Christians, we know the love of the father has for us. So you can see there's a, a, a type here. Um, and then we see the communion of the son, as we saw that bread was given to Saul to have that meal with him. And uh, same thing for us. We have communion with Jesus 
Uh, without communion with Jesus, we cannot bear fruit. We need to abide in him. As Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. And then lastly, we see the empowerment of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> upon our life. So without that, you have no uh, power for service. You know, it's, otherwise it's a work of the flesh. Uh, so without that, um, you know, we, we cannot be serving the Lord effectively. You know, it's just, um, you're going to burn out. You're going to, um, it's just not going to work for the Lord. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 24, verse 49, I send my promise of uh, my father upon you, but tarry in the city in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. And so that happened before uh, Pentecost happened uh, when the spirit was going to be poured out upon his disciples. Otherwise, they couldn't fulfill the great commission without the spirit of God. And you might see that, uh, these are really prerequisites for the child of God for service. The, the love of the Father, the communion of the Son, <clears throat> and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And when you look at the life of Saul, though, <clears throat> he wasn't really a spiritual man. Um, yes, God used him, but as we'll see as we look at his life, there wasn't much in regards for his love for the Lord or his worship of God. You don't see any of that. Uh, he was a changed man. Uh, God did empower him, but it's going to be short-lived, uh, and he's going to be a man of the flesh and not of the spirit. Now, that phrase in verse 7 there, uh, do as the occasion demands. So basically, Samuel's just telling Saul, just go with the flow. Sometimes a person can be so bogged down wondering about every little detail in their life. We want to know every little thing, like the Melways maps. You know, we need to know every direction instead of just go. You know, and we wonder if God wants them to wear white socks or black socks, or should we uh, have uh, eggs for breakfast or cereal, or uh, should I take a right turn or left turn at the light or just go straight? You know, so they, they wonder about these all these little things, and we worry too much, but. The thing is, when you're filled with the Spirit, there is a sense in uh, much of the time you just do as the occasion uh, serves. Just do what God puts before you. You know, he, He'll work it out. He'll lead you uh, as you're moving. Uh, and there's still going to be times that we do need to seek the Lord, seek His counsel, wait upon Him. But there's some things that we just need to simply go with it. Go with the flow. You know, don't worry about it. It will take care of itself. God will work that, through that next bend with you. You know, and it's just walking in the spirit. You never know. Verse eight goes on to say, and you shall go down before me to Gilgal and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So you simply go to this town, wait for him to arrive and then he's going to arrive in seven days. It kind of seems strange. Um, maybe he's trying to teach uh, Saul uh, some patience and humility here, um, perhaps. And as the new king had to wait for Samuel, as you know, kings and leaders don't like to wait for anyone because they're king, right? Uh, there's probably another reason why he had him go to Gilgal, um, but either way, he asked him to go there, and this is what you're going to do. Verse 9 goes on to say, so it was when he had turned his back uh, to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, uh, and all those signs came to pass that day. And so when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. And the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, What is this that's come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And then the man from answered, says, but who is their father? Therefore, it became a prophet, is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had finished prophesying, he went to the high place. So as it says here that God gave him a new heart, so one that would be sensitive to the Lord. Uh, but again, uh, Saul is going to harden himself to the things of God as the chapters will progress. But at this point, the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied uh, and, and the people were wondering what's going on with Saul. Um, and that phrase is Saul among the prophets. The idea here is to use our kind of modern vernacular. Uh, did Saul get religious? You know, did he, you know, um, did he get religious on us? Um, did he get religion or whatever, you know? So just there's something that's happened here. It's weird that this would happen to this guy. 
And it was a change in his life and the people recognized it. And may that be true of us, you know, and I know it's true with uh, a lot of the testimonies I hear uh, that God's changes and people are family and friends. They see there's something different about you, you know, uh, before Christ and after you come to Christ. And uh, so it should affect our, our actions uh, and, and may this change be real, not just for show. Another question you notice there also in verse 12 is, but who is their father? So the idea here is, <clears throat> who is inspiring these prophets to speak as if God is? <clears throat> that the, why is it so strange to think that God can use Saul uh, to speak through? And again, God can use a donkey. It's, it, he can use anybody. So if, they're, if God is their inspiration, then why would it be strange that God would inspire an unlikely man like such as Saul? Well, verse 14 goes on to say, Then Saul's uncle said to him and his servants, Where did you go? And he says, I took uh, to look for the donkeys. <clears throat> and when we saw that there was nowhere to be found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, please, what Samuel said to you. So Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys have been found about the matter of the kingdom. Uh, he did not tell him what Samuel had said. It'd be kind of interesting. Maybe the uncle had an, a suspicion, something different about him. Um, and it kind of seems strange that Saul didn't tell his uncle about all that Samuel told him. Is he telling back, um, you know, because of humility, um, you know, there's a lot of potential reasons why. Some feel, he, again, he's just being humble. Uh, the same attitude he demonstrated before Samuel, that is possible. But as you look at the life of Saul, though, uh, you see his actions are different here. Uh, I think that Saul is holding back because of his lack of belief, um, maybe uncertainty, faithlessness, you know, just not trying to, he's trying to process it all. Um, and, and so we, we're going to see that Saul was not a man of faith. Verse uh, 17 goes on to say, Then Samuel called the people together uh, to the Lord at Mizpah. Mizpah, by the way, is one of those gathering places for the nation. It was where Samuel had uh, the, gathered the people in their last battle against the Philistines back in chapter 7. So if you kind of remember that uh, situation. Verse 18 goes on to say, So, uh, and said to the children of Israel, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and deliver you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that those who oppress you. But you have today rejected your God, who himself saved you from your adversaries and your tribulations. And you shall have said to him, uh, No, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your clans. So this dialogue is almost as if uh, Samuel's trying to give the people one more chance before Samuel uh, uh, publicly anoints Saul as their king. You know, here, here's one more chance to back out of this deal. Uh, so he publicly states to the crowd how they have rejected God. And uh, he's reading how the crowd have chosen a king against God's will. Now, Samuel um, prepares to give the, the people what they want, the king. Uh, so he gathers the tribe, uh, he speaks to them, um, and, and you're wondering how in the world could they do something like this? You know, if you think about it, all that God has done for them, and yet they don't want him to rule and reign in their lives. And we would say, how foolish are they? They saw miracles, they experience so many amazing things, and they can go back in their history. But before we're too harsh on um, the children of Israel, what about us though? You know, uh, what about uh, when we desire earthly leaders or earthly things to reign our lives after all that God has done for us? Right. So it doesn't look good when we put it in that perspective, but it's easy to say how foolish that they were. But yet we're just as foolish. Um, and so we need to let the Lord rule and reign in our hearts and our lives because he knows and has what is best for us. Verse 20 goes on to say, When Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. And we had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families. The family of Matria uh, was chosen. And Saul, uh, the son of Kish, was chosen. But when they sought him, they could not find him, or he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, Has the man not 
come here yet? And the answer, the Lord answers says, he's hiding among the equipment and the baggage. So here we see uh, Saul is chosen by king by lot. Um, but, but understand um, that this wasn't under the, uh, it was under the guidance of the, of the Lord, not random chance happening here. So God's behind it all. And it appears the order uh, uh, to, to find out the proper person who should be made their king, they determine by lot. And you notice by tribe, by the thousands or grand divisions, the families, uh, then it was the smaller division of families, uh, and then it was the individual. So you saw the progression there. Uh, so when the lot was cast, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. Uh, and when the thousands, the division of Matria was taken. And then for the family, the family of Kish was taken. And then for the indi individual, Saul was taken. And again, I don't think any of his family knew that this was going to be the case. But yet God is confirming that he's the man. So as Saul is chosen, uh, they can't seem to locate him. You know, he's, he's gone AWOL. He's missing. And uh, the, the question goes out, is Saul even among here? You know, is he, is he even here yet? And yet the Lord tells him he's hiding among the equipment. He's in the baggage, you know. That's your king over there. I don't know about you, but that's not exactly the leader I'm looking for, you know, or would be looking for in this situation. That's going to lead them out into battle. Now, some may see that this is humility on the part of Saul. I don't see this humility here. I just see it's that lack of faith. And again, maybe still doubting. Maybe if he's hiding that uh, he's going to be dismissed and someone else is going to be chosen. Perhaps that's going through his mind. Yet God had told him through Samuel that he was going to be king. Uh, he had already anointed him service, and now he's going to recognize him before the people. So it was a private anointing first, and then it's going to be a public anointing. So if, again, if God has called uh, a person into ministry to serve, the thing is he's going to equip them for the service, for the task. Because otherwise there's no way you can do it. You know, how am I going to do this task? Well, he's going to give you what you need. He's going to give you the gifts and the ability. He's going to put people along your path. Uh, and it does take time to develop and to, and to mature. It doesn't happen overnight. And as uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9.8, that God is able to make all the grace abound toward you, that you always have it all sufficiency in all things, that you have abundance for every good work. So he's going to give you what you need to fulfill whatever task, however big or however little it may be. It doesn't matter. That little bit makes a difference. And yet Saul didn't have that kind of faith, and so he's hiding uh, from God's will. Verse 23 goes on to say, So they ran and brought him there, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upwards. So since Saul was hiding, some of the people ran to go get him. And when he was presented before the people, there he stood taller above everyone, handsome, uh, who was going to be their king. <clears throat> Truly, when you look at him outwardly, he had the looks to, to be it. You know, inwardly, there's problems demonstrating lack of faith already, lack of faith in God and character issues, as we'll see. And again, this is how the world picks their leaders, how it picks their politicians, how it picks their kings. And, and someone who looks like the leader uh, can be very deceiving, though, you know, so uh, be careful there. And so uh, as verse 24 goes on to say, Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There, there's none like him among the people. So all the people shouted and says, long live the king. There is that phrase. Um, uh, you asked for it, you got it, right? This is what you're going to get. Well, in a sense, this is what Samuel saying to the people and not in a good way, but as a, uh, in the way the saying is meant. But he was telling them, hey, look, is there any man among else like this man among the people? Of course, they're not going to find this is it. And if you think about it, he was hiding and the people had to go and get him, drag him out so he could be placed as their king. Yet they still wanted the king instead of now nah, we'll pass. And yet the people longed for this day and they shouted, long live the king. Go, Charles. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so. <clears throat> but they weren't interested in what he was doing, but by his appearance that he was their king. It was, it was about the appearance of everything. So, and, and sad, yet people still do that today, placing things on the throne of their lives instead of the Lord. 
Verse 25, so then Samuel <clears throat> explained to the people the behavior of royalty. And he wrote it in a book and laid it upon before the, pe the Lord. And so Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Saul also went home to Gibeah, and valiant men went with him, whose hearts God had touched. So after all <clears throat> this, we see how Samuel you know, discharges all the people. They all head home. Uh, it almost seems kind of anticlimactic, right? But I love what God does here. Uh, Saul, he doesn't head home alone, but these valiant men uh, follow after him. Men whose lives God had touched. Isn't that amazing? After Saul, uh, to, to help assist him in the ministry, the task of leading, etc. And how important that is. And I love how God does that, how he touches people's hearts. And they go on and assist in the work of the ministry, in the church or whatever uh, is out there. And understand, again, the work here at Calvary is not done solely by me. It can't be done by me alone. But God has touched men and women to assist in the work whose hearts are knitted together or knitted to mine. And, um, and what a blessing it has been uh, to me and to this church. And uh, it's, a, it's a healthy church, a body working together for the, the betterment of itself. And again, everyone has a part to play. You know, just even showing up, the gift of the presence makes a difference. You know, you start to see the momentum, you see the excitement, uh, the faith, the prayers, um, just people coming together. And so Samuel most likely is explaining what a king would be like and what is expected of them and how uh, they would lord over the people. So he wrote it down for the people, and it wasn't a good thing, uh, but they needed to be aware of what they're getting themselves into. And again, there's still all that warning. This is what's going to happen. Uh, verse 27 continues, but some of the rebels said, how can this man save us? So they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So not everyone is supportive of Saul as their king. When I got voted in here, it wasn't a unanimous vote. <laughs> Not a surprise. Most of the people didn't even know me, but that's okay. Um, but they refused to honor him. Um, and, and he could have crushed them. He could have put them to death, but he didn't. We're told that he held his peace. Notice that. Uh, and there's a great lesson for us as well to hold our peace in uh, these sort of situations. And I think Samuel or Saul did a good thing here. Um, but this is where we need to be careful about defending yourself. Uh, sometimes it's better just to be quiet. Let it play it out, you know. Um, just um, let the Lord do what he needs to do. There's times where you need to say something, do something. Uh, but sometimes the best thing is just, just hold your peace. Um, and so in the previous verse, we saw that the positive aspects of the ministry, the men coming alongside to assist him. Now we see the negative, uh, those who refuse. And there's always going to be those who will come against the uh, troublemakers, the rebels, as it says here. Uh, those who disagree with how things are going. And instead of praying about it um, and speaking to those who have a problem with it, uh, they end up uh, causing issues or pro uh, division. Uh, they leave the church. Uh, they would rather cause disunity and division uh, within the church rather than deal with their issues or their critical spirits or whatever else. And, and it's sad to see the enemy control the lives of these people. It's not of the Lord. Uh, and this might be harsh, but uh, you, you look at what they leave behind. Uh, it, so many times it's just disaster and destruction, you know, fractured relationships and whatnot. But here we see Saul showing some signs of restraint, and he ignores these troublemakers. Wise thing to do. Now, as we move on to chapter 10, or from chapter 10 to chapter 11, we move from Saul to an, a guy named Nahash, and uh, uh, an Ammonite, uh, to the area of Jabesh Gilead, uh, and that's on the east side of the Jordan. So the story is going to continue. So verse uh, 1 of chapter 11 goes on to say, Then Nahash the Ammonite came and encamped against Jebesh Gilead. And all the men of Jebesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us and we'll serve you. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this condition, I'll make you a covenant with you that I may put out all your right eyes and bring reproach on all Israel. So is uh, the 
Jabesh Gilead is in the area where half the tribe of Manasseh settled. So some settled outside the land and on the east side of the Jordan River. And this is located about 30, 32 kilometers um, south of the Sea of Galilee. So if you have your maps, you can see it's kind of in a different area there. And so the Ammonites on the other hand uh, came from the area which is modern day um, Ammon, Jordan. Uh, which is south of Jebesh Gilead. And if you remember from Judges chapter 11, uh, that Jephthah and the children of Israel soundly defeated the Ammonites, uh, and it is possible that now they're fighting back in revenge uh, of that loss by Japheth. So they're threatening the people of Jabesh uh, uh, Gilead, and, and as much as they wanted to make a deal with Nahash, uh, they will serve this king if he spares their life. Obviously, it makes sense uh, because the Ammonites were a strong military uh, power. And uh, really, what else can the people of uh, Jabesh Gilead do? Uh, they could have repented. Uh, they could have uh, brought their request to the Lord. Uh, but instead, they make this covenant with the enemy. Uh, and, and that's always a wrong thing to do. Don't make a covenant with your enemy, especially Satan. Um, and, and so instead of humbling themselves before the Lord and confessing their sins and, and brought the, that brought them into the trouble, they put God altogether aside, based their offer to become servants of the Ammonites. Uh, and we see that the sad effect of sin here, the careless living um, in lowering men's spirits, sapping courage, discouraging the noble efforts. And so this condition that um, Nahash um, makes... Uh, to, to spare the, the people of Jebesh Gilead seems pretty strange, right? Uh, but it was a very uh, practical back then. You see, by putting out the right eye, uh, your enemy has made them ineffective for battle. Uh, the reason is that you would hold your shield in your left hand and would cover your face to protect it. So the only part that would be exposed would be your right eyes as you look behind the shield. Uh, as you peek around it and you see what's going on. But if your right eye's out, you have to move your whole face to see around. So now you're exposed uh, and uh, you'd be left uh, wide open uh, for serious injury and mortal wound. So that was a very practical um, um, uh, tactic here. And that's why Nahash made this condition in the covenant. Uh, so his enemy would be vulnerable and would be humiliating action of men um, uh, for the city. But as you look at what Nahash is doing, he's really a type of Satan uh, in our lives, our enemy. Uh, to give you a couple of examples, I'll show you what I mean. Satan attacks, but he cannot do anything against us without our agreement. You have to open that door. He'll, he'll press you, he'll do all kinds of stuff, but there's where when you open the door, he will do all those things. But you have to make that uh, open agreement with him. Uh, so he asks uh, for us to surrender to him and over to these things. Um, so why are we surrendering to him when we surrender our lives to the Lord uh, and we're guided by the Spirit of God? Uh, another um, thought that comes here is Satan wants us to serve him. And he'll uh, attempt to uh, intimidate us in giving in to him. So intimidation is another tactic of the enemy. He'll do whatever it takes for us to serve him. So don't fall for his deceptions. Satan also wants to humiliate us and exalt himself over us. That's another tactic. Uh, through humiliation, uh, one of his saints, uh, Satan brings reproach upon God's people. And you, you hear so many stories of what happens out there. Um, and it just brings uh, reproach uh, and a bad uh, rap among Christians. Satan will try to get us to fall, to stumble, to, uh, to sin. And if that happens, uh, you know, again, we bring it before the Lord, repent, start walking with the Lord. Your sins, again, have been paid in full. But don't give the enemy the resources to bring reproach upon God and upon his people. Satan wants to take away your ability to fight effectively against him as well. So again, he keeps people uh, hidden from understanding the weapons of our warfare. Uh, the, uh, by, by isolating us, uh, by getting us so distracted and so busy, we're not spending time in prayer and in his word or keeping us uh, in fellowship with uh, the people of the Lord. Uh, and we know this, but don't fall prey to it. So we know these things, you know, so we know we can do better. Satan wants to blind us. And if he can't blind us completely, he'll blind us partially. 
Uh, he does this by dangling sin in front of us, like a piece of uh, uh, candy as it's getting close to Halloween. You know, here's some candy, and uh, but be wise, don't partake of it. Uh, don't let them make you uh, think that there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, it's only one piece of candy, um, but this candy can be deadly. By the way, Nahash, his, mean, his name means serpent or snake. Interesting. I guess I don't have to say any more there, but uh, Satan is the serpent. He is the snake. Verse 3 goes on to say, Then the elders of Jebesh said to him, Hold off for seven days that we may send messengers to all the territory of Israel. And then if there's no one to save us, we will come out to you. So here the leaders of Jebesh are asking Nahash to wait seven days. And if no one comes, again, we're going to surrender to him and uh, put out the right eye. Now about you, but uh, for me, it's hard to imagine why Nahash would agree to wait seven days to see if anyone would come to the aid of Jebesh, Gilead. Uh, but there might be a couple explanations. One of them is they might have felt very secure in their strength of his army, and thus his pride played a role in this decision. So that's uh, a thought there. Another thought would be the people of Jebesh didn't come to assist Israel in battle against Benjamin. Um, Benjamin uh, for their gross sins that they committed and thus Nahash may have felt this since the men of Jabesh couldn't help Israel then Israel would uh, not come to their assistance uh, so he waited uh, so he was aware of this and then also the nation was in disunity it thus uh, may have been thought that no one would gather together to come to the aid of the people so these are all different scenarios that uh, could have played into this uh, verse 4 goes on to say, So the messengers came to Gi Gibeah and Saul and told the news of hearing of the people. And all the people lifted their voices and wept. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field. And Saul says, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jebesh. So here's uh, another reason that we're, perhaps there is disunity in Israel. Yes, Saul had acknowledged uh, as the king, but he uh, was uh, not the first to hear of this news. He hears it th through something else. Instead of, okay, he, if he's the appointed leader, he should get in the first report of this. Uh, since there was, again, no central government, there was no organized leadership at this time. So it's not like, okay, you're a king now. You already have everything in place. You already have an administrator. This is the first thing that's happening. There's none of that in order. Uh, these messengers uh, from Jabesh Gilead are just traveling, letting people know the problem. And so Saul hears about it. So why is Saul coming from behind the herds uh, that were in the fields if he was king? And again, uh, there was no organization. Uh, he, he didn't know what to do, uh, where to start. And, and it's just working, starting to work out. Um, and as he's working out, again, God's going to show him what to do. And I think uh, this is a great lesson for us as well, that we're not to sit back and do nothing, but we are to be busy about our father's business, to be working, serving the Lord, and he will direct you in what you need to do. So it's just one of those simple principles. Verse 6 goes on to say, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard the news, and his anger aroused greatly. So as Saul hears of this, uh, what Nahash wants to do to the men of Jebesh Gilead, uh, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and he begins to quack like a duck, bark like a dog, laugh uncontrolled, be drunk in the Spirit. No, that's not what it says. But God's Spirit it doesn't do that. You know, it didn't come upon Saul to entertain him, but to empower him for the work that God had for him. And that's the thing, that God's Spirit was to equip him for service. You see, the power to serve the Lord, to be witnesses for him, it's not to uh, toot our own whistle, to blow our own horn, but it's to move the gospel message out there, to minister to his people, to move forward. May we not forget that as well. So as the Spirit comes upon Saul, when Saul hears what's going on, he's filled with anger. Now, some may say, well, this anger is wrong, right? That, that we shouldn't be filled with anger. But that's not exactly correct. There is a righteous anger, a, a, an anger of indignation that is not sin. Uh, that it's when you see someone taking advantage of over another that you rise up to the aid of that person. That is a righteous anger. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's an anger that people come against uh, the Lord. 
Um, there is an anger that is also selfish anger, an anger that responds to when someone has done something to us, we feel that we got to get back at them. Vengeance is mine, not the Lord's, right? Idea. And so many times it's anger that we refuse to let go, but instead we let it boil inside, inside of us until we burst. As it says in Ephesians 4, 6 and, uh, 26 and 27, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So as believers, we are, again, new creations in Christ. Old things have passed away, all things become new. Uh, so the new man doesn't let his emotions deteriorate uh, into sin, uh, giving room for the devil to work. And so we need to uh, work through these issues, deal with it, confess it, um, you know, uh, before it reaches that boiling point. Now, the word that Paul used um, or didn't use, I should say, in, in, in Ephesians there for anger, it's not the, the Greek word, um, which... Uh, Hard to pronounce it, uh, pergamaros, uh, which is far more than just a momentary outburst of emotion. So these are deep-seated emotions that are like cancer that spreads very quickly. Uh, this type of anger is kind of like a shotgun, you know, it just explodes at once, but the damage is done is incredible. Um, the anger that is kindled uh, will grow out of control and it will destroy everything it touches, like a volcano. As Paul says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Settle your anger before it gets out of control, as another translation says. So it doesn't matter if you're right or not. Deal with it, because if you don't, you're going to give place to the devil. And you become bitter and angry and miserable. Uh, it destroys our relationships. Uh, if there's someone that you're angry against, um, deal with it. Uh, you know, when you get a chance, ask for forgiveness, work through it, whatever it is. Don't let your anger grow uh, until you, you blow it, you know. Uh, deal with it. Settle it in your heart uh, before your wrath is seen and you sin and it turns into resentment and jealousy and critical spirits and it just continues. The anger that is sin is self-centered, self-focused, uh, and, and it needs to be dealt with. So if, if, if not, you're going to give place, a foothold to the devil, and that can become a stronghold, and you give opportunity um, you know, for the enemy to just destroy your life there. But the word that Paul uses there in Ephesians, it's another word for anger. As you know, there's multiple words for it. But this one is, is, speaks of becoming exasperated to provoke, to be aggravated. And I think that Paul's point here is not letting someone push your buttons and cause you to sin, but to stay in control, stay close to the Lord, and let him move you instead of someone else. So that's kind of the thought behind here. So this anger that Saul was feeling is an anger to respond, to protect. So as verse 7 goes on to say, he took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel with the hands of the messenger, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to this oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the people, and they came out with one consent. And when he had numbered them among Bezek, the children of Israel were 300,000, and the men of Judah 30,000. So, here we see Saul trying to rally the troops for battle. He cuts up this oxen. He sends it throughout the land as an incentive to join. And if you don't, this is what's going to be done. You know, so it sounds very similar if you remember in Judges chapter um, 19 through 21 or so, where the Levite did that to the concubine after the men of uh, Gibeah had raped and killed her. So the Levite again had taken the uh, dead man's wife and cut her into pieces, sent her all throughout the uh, land of Israel to send a message. And I imagine when the people um, of Israel got meat delivered to their doorstep, <laughs> they knew something serious was up, you know. So, and as a result, the nation ended up joining together to fight uh, their brethren against the enemy for the people of Jebesh Gilead. Verse 9 goes on to say, Then they said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall say to the men of Jebesh Gilead, Tomorrow by the time the sun is hot, you shall have help. And then the messenger came and reported to the men of Jebesh, and they were glad. And so therefore the men of Jebesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do to us whatever uh, seems uh, good to you. 
So they hear this amazing news. Uh, they're they're going to get the assistance and helping them out. Uh, so they're glad. And it must have been a sigh of relief. Relief, knowing uh, that they're they're not ostracized because uh, they're indwelling on the east side of the Jordan, um, and they they you know, weren't um, coming to the aid uh, earlier against the tribe of Benjamin. So they're putting the past behind them. Um, that's over. God's people have forgiven, forgotten. Uh, and now they're going to fight together for the betterment of the nation. And that's another great lesson for the body of Christ, for us to come together against the battles we face with the enemy. So there's a lot of brothers and sisters and a lot of other churches. We're still on the same page. We might do things differently, but we're here in this fight together. We need to rally that together. And as we see with the, the leaders of Jebesh Gilead, uh, some small tactics here to tell Nahash tomorrow. You know, that they'll, they'll let them know their answer. So they're just stalling until the help arrives. Um, and so that's what's going to happen. Verse 11 goes on to say, So it was the next day Saul put the people in three companies. And they came against uh, into the midst of the camp of the morning watch and killed the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. So as he puts these men into uh, this force, they marched all night. And again, as we said, it was about some 32 kilometers away. Um, and they make this surprise attack um, upon the Ammonites during the morning watch. That is between uh, 3 and 6 p.m. or 6 a.m. Uh, so that's kind of the morning watch time. So as Saul um, and his new uh, army defeated the Ammonites soundly, uh, they, they, they utterly routed the people so that the city of Jebesh Gilead were spared. Now understand, Saul was a farmer. He wasn't a warrior. Uh, and, and yet his strategy was beautiful. You see, when God calls a person into the ministry or into this position, he equips them. And as he did with Saul to accomplish uh, the work he was called to do. So again, this wisdom came from the Lord to uh, work out this particular plan. And that's, uh, we can take comfort in that, you know, that there's a process to the work and development. Again, like we said, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's important to be faithful in the little things. But again, just as you're stepping out in faith, the Lord will give you what you need, what you need to say. How are we going to work through this problem? How are we going to strategize uh, against the enemy here? He'll give you what you need. Uh, so again, Saul didn't win this battle through military might, but through the power of the Lord, ultimately, uh, that was upon him. So God gave him victory, and to think anything less would be would be pride. And so we need to give glory to the Lord. Um, verse 12 goes on to say, When the people said to Samuel, Who is he who says, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, No man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. And again, if you remember the incident back in chapter 10, verse 27, where um, Saul was chosen by Lot and some had responded, you know, how can this man save us? So they didn't really have that positive uh, response. They despised him. They brought him no presence. But again, Saul held his peace. So after victory, again, these people wanted to, uh, these men to put these people to death for coming against Saul. But I love Saul's response here, though. Uh, he basically says uh, that, you know, this is the Lord's day. You know, he's given us victory. He has brought salvation to Israel or uh, he has saved Israel from the enemies. And thus he will get the glory for this day. So uh, no dark cloud was going to be cast over what God had done. Um, this isn't, you know, the right thing to do to, to attack these people. You know, this is where uh, uh, like Saul had to rise above that situation, not be petty with these people and, you know, smite them and kill them. Again, this is the Lord's uh, victory. Uh, Satan is defeated. But as you know, Satan doesn't give up. He'll keep going. He'll keep trying. Uh, if he can't defeat Israel from the outside, he's going to attack from within. And that's the way he does. That's the greater threat is the attacks within the church, not so outside the church. I know there's both, but that's the greater threat for the body of Christ is the divisions that's happened within. Uh, so getting the children of Israel together to fight against each other is the plan of the enemy. Verse uh, 14, Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. 
So all the people went to Gilgal, and there made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And they made sacrifices of peace offering before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So again, remember uh, that Gilgal was the place the children of Israel had first set up camp as they entered the uh, land of Canaan. And now the place where they were crowning their king. Uh, and um, so he, he was the man who started out in humility. But as we know, his life will come crashing down. Um, and so the, the thought that Saul was already king, what's all this about? So we saw that kind of played out. But keep in mind back in chapter 10 uh, that Saul was anointed by Samuel uh, individually. And then we see how Saul was chosen um, to be king by casting lots. So there's more confirmation. And now we see here that Saul is confirmed by the people to be king. So there's this progression and so the entire nation now recognizes Saul as their king. And one day they're going to start looking for um, to, to lead them into battle had arrived, or so they thought. Yes, again, the Spirit of God came upon Saul, uh, but I don't think Saul was really ever saved. Uh, he was a man of the flesh, not of the Spirit, as we're going to see as the study uh, moves on. Um, and, and that's the thing. There's people that start out well, but they don't finish well. Um, and and I, I love that what Paul says, and again, that important, that steadfast faith, where he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I have kept the faith. So it's not how you start, it's how you finish. You know, and that's my prayer for all of us, that we finish well, and we finish strong, and that we stand firm, because uh, the time is short, you know. Um, amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we can gather together to study, to, to grow into a deeper love relationship with you. And um, the, the things that you spoke to us through this chapter, uh, in these chapters, I should say, that you would minister to us, that we would apply these things, that we take heed to what your spirit is saying to all of us, that we would uh, fight the good fight, that we'd finish well. So bless my precious brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen.